Hello intermediate double basses and welcome to the third tutorial video here at the Virtual Benedetti Sessions. Now I'm sure you've had so much to get your teeth stuck into. I'll just remind you that if you've not already watched them then it's a great idea to go back and look at our tutorial video number one and our tutorial video number two. In the first tutorial video I talked quite generally about all three pieces of music and there was a few tips and ideas of what to practice. In the second tutorial, we got really stuck into the Warlock and the Vaughan Williams in a bit more detail. And today I'm going to be talking a lot more about the Paganini. But before you even think about watching this video, make sure that you go back and take a look at our warm-up videos. Because they are really, really good and super important for getting our bodies warmed up. And there's lots of nice ideas to get our shoulders moving, get our arms moving, and to get ready for playing our double bass. As I said, today is all about Paganini. We're going to go through the piece, we're going to talk about Paganini, we're going to talk about the arrangement, so let's get to it. So Paganini, or Niccolo Paganini, was an Italian violinist. He was born uh, at the end of the 18th century and then lived into the 19th century, and he was widely known and regarded as one of the greatest violinists on the planet. And he was uh, well known for touring all across the land and giving these incredible virtuosic performances and you know always willing to whip his violin out and wow an audience wherever he was. Now the caprices, he wrote 24 of these caprices which were kind of solo pieces uh, or solo studies for the violin, really difficult and they all kind of focused in on a certain technique or a certain skill. And the 24th one, which is the one that we are playing and has been beautifully arranged by the Ayub sisters, um, is probably the most famous and also one of the most difficult for violin. It starts with a theme and then you move on and the, there are different variations involving bits of the theme. And that's similar to what we've got in our orchestral part. We have the theme and then we move through different variations. As I was saying, the caprices are quite difficult and technically challenging. So our double bass part, it's no surprise there are some real technical challenges in there that we're gonna talk about. But first things first, we're gonna do a wee exercise to get started. Okay, now we've talked a bit about Paganini and talked a little bit about the piece. We're gonna do a little exercise to get us ready for working on that music. And it is a rhythm exercise, which are some of my favorite exercises to do. So if you have a metronome at home, um, can you get that metronome and set it to 50, which is super slow. If you don't have a metronome, don't panic, because I have my metronome here, I'm going to be putting it on and you can hear that through the video and join in that way. So with my metronome set to 50, I'm going to start it off so that you can hear that's really slow. I want us to start marching on the beat. One, two, one, two, join it. One, two, one, two, one, two, one. Two, one. Two. Excellent. I'm going to keep that going. And if we think back to the second tutorial video, I was talking a lot about subdivisions in the Vaughan Williams, which help us sort of fill the gap between big beats and the pulse. And we can add them now, like this. One and two. Add. One and two. Add. One and two. And one and two. And join in with me. Ready. One and two. And two. One and two and excellent guys. I'm just gonna stop my metronome for a second. That's fantastic. And I know it might seem a little bit strange in a double bass tutorial to be sort of standing away from our instrument and doing kind of rhythm exercises, but it's so important that we kind of look after and that we put all the rhythm into our bodies first, because that means when we come to put it onto our instrument, it's much easier and it's gonna be super effective. Okay, now level two of this exercise, we are going to add a rhythm over the top of our beat. So we're putting the beat in our feet, that's our marching in two, and then we're gonna clap a rhythm over the top. And this rhythm involves one of my favorite things of all time. Are you ready? Potatoes. That's right, I said it, potatoes. If they're boiled, if they're baked, if they're mashed, if they're smashed, if they're crisps, if it's chips, if it's a flying potato, I love them all. They're one of my favorite things in the world, okay? and. We're going to use this word potato for our rhythm and I'm going to show you how. So we're going to set up our beat again. I'm going to start my metronome. So I'm going to start marching. One, two, one, two. And here comes the rhythm. One, two, po-ti-to, 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 po-ti-to. Okay, so let's join in with me. If you can, here we go. And po 
Bo, Jay, Jo, Bo, Jay, Jo, Bo, Jay, Jo, Bo, Jay, Jo, Bo, Jay, Jo. Amazing, guys. Now, that's a really, really useful exercise um, to practice, to get warmed up for working on this Paganini. And I will reveal why later. But the best thing about these videos is that if you maybe haven't quite got that exercise yet, no problem. You can pause the video, you can go back, you can revisit this bit and give that another try along with me. Remember metronome on 50 or just using the metronome that I've got playing on the video and get the beat in your feet and the potatoes in your hands. The first bit we're going to look at in the Paganini is at the opening. So we have uh, four bars rest for clicks, then there's eight bar rest while the theme comes in. And then we come in at the second half of bar 13. And I'm just going to uh, say the rhythm through from bar 13 to about bar 20, just so we can get an idea of that rhythm. Okay? So it goes rest, ba, ba, da, rest, rest, ba, ba, da, rest, rest, ba, da, rest, ba, da, rest, ba, ba, da. Quite simple for me to say it through like that. And that can be a really useful exercise, just talking through the rhythm. Um, or going through it with your music whilst listening to the track as well. Now the bit I really want to focus in there is the bada, which is the semi-quaver to quaver or a uh, 16th note to 8th note, um, which comes and almost always we have it up down. Bada, bada, up down. And that can be quite challenging. So let's talk about a few ways to think about that bow stroke. As usual, I'll talk through uh, both German bow and French bow uh, techniques for this because it is slightly different for them. I'm going to start with German bow and for German bow I was trying to think about it's like this flick so the up down and it's a little bit like I don't tell anyone I told you this but a little bit like a school or you know anywhere if you get like paper towels and you make them really wet and then you kind of throw them at the ceiling to make them stick on the ceiling. I mean I never did that okay I never even thought about doing that but that action of throwing it up throwing your hand up to the sky and then it's snapping back as you let go of it. That's really similar to how it's going to feel when we're on the string and we sort of have to bada, bada, and we're flicking our hand to the side. You can also think about it a little bit like um, like a yo-yo, bada, bada, but sort of because we're playing this way, obviously, it's like a sideways yo-yo, bada, dada, like that. For French bow, it's a little bit different and there's a great exercise you can try. Um, now, if you're just uh, seamlessly, I'm going to produce a tea towel out of nowhere. You can use a tea towel or, I don't know, a t-shirt or anything, okay? And um, I'm going to talk about something that I definitely never did when I was little and young and annoying. But, um, uh, about, you know, sometimes you can maybe, if you get a tea towel and spin it around and then you can, whoosh, and you can sort of, whoosh, um, and kind of whip other people on their legs, you know, but I mean, I never did that and you should never do that either. Um, but this, uh, this entire feeling of uh, flicking the towel out and back again, bada, bada, and thinking about our index finger, our first finger, that's almost certainly the kind of feeling that we want in our bow stroke, bada, because we're, we're snapping it out quickly and then immediately backwards. So up, down, bada, up, down, bada. So try that at home. Definitely don't try it near anyone. Just try it, you know, you can try it on the curtains. It's a good one. Uh, or, um, you know, on some furniture and just try and get a good snap. Ba -da, ba -da. And that can work really nicely. Now, I can almost hear you, lots of you kind of going, what on earth is he talking about? Talking about tea towels and yo-yos going sideways and paper towels and things. And um, I know it's a little bit weird, but I promise these are great ideas. And I really, really um, I want you to go and try these um, ideas away from your bass and away from your bow so you get a real feel of what I'm talking about and the hand movements required and then once you've got once you've done that go and get your bow get your bass and especially with your if you get your bow get a beautiful bow hold uh, for French bow and you can hold the tip with your other hand and just practice that sort of flicking da -da, ba -da, the tea towel flick and really that idea of flicking it away and then snapping it back to get a snap and then for our German bow uh, we talked a little bit about the sideways yo-yo. Um, similar thing, got a beautiful bow hold. And then imagine that we're throwing the yo-yo and then snapping it back on the string. Da-da, da-da, da-da. Like that. Fantastic. So for putting this onto our instruments with the French bow first, we're going to look at bars 17 and 18. Um, and I'm going to look at bars 17 
first. And the reason we're looking at these bars is that it just has the bada in it. It's a great place to start looking at this bow stroke. And uh, I'm going to take my bow and this bow stroke starts from the string. So we plant our bow on the string, make sure we've got a good grip. Remember that idea of, you know, getting hold of the string and wobbling it back and forwards so that um, we know we've got a good point of contact. And then we want a fast flick up and a fast flick back down um, for this bow stroke like this. Do that again. And this can be quite a hard bow, uh, bow stroke to kind of do repetitively. So I'd recommend building it up and shortening that gap between your um, attempts. But always thinking T-tail, snap, snap. With the German bow, exactly the same thing. Bar 17, um, we can find that B. Get the bow on the string, get a good grip. And again, that flick of the yo-yo really coming from the fingers as well. Great. Now this bow stroke is also further complicated with our first entry because we have a note that comes before the bada. Now this note also has to start from the string and we have to start our bow, stop it dead and then do the bada like this. Now I did that in kind of slow motion to give you a better idea. I'll do it one more time so you can sort of see. I'm talking about bar 13 here. So it's one, so we can see that the snap action, ba-da, it's exactly the same um, feeling in our hand, ba-da, but we have to make sure that we um, control our arm and lift our arm to make it over onto the D string. Same for the one that comes after that with the G to the C is one. So whether you're French or German bow, make sure you're practicing that bow stroke both on one string and also across two strings, because that string crossing can add another layer of difficulty to it. The next thing to look at for the Paganini that can really help us out are a couple of scales. So we're gonna look at our A natural minor scale and our A major scale. So first up, the A natural minor, and don't worry if you've not heard of this before. It's quite simple, and we'll talk through it now. So we start on our open A, and the reason that it's so easy to remember is that there are no flats, no sharps, and we just go up A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. And that sounds and looks like this. Now for our A major, obviously things are a little bit different because we have three sharps. We have an F sharp, a C sharp, and a G sharp. So we're gonna go up A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, and then from four fingers on that F sharp, we can either travel down the neck and finish two, four in third position like we do for our D major scale, or we can go from four fingers on the F sharp in first position, over onto the G, up into half position, and play one, two to finish that scale. And that sounds and looks like this. Now we've got those notes under our fingers and into our brains, it's important that we practice them again and again to really cement them. And just like in tutorial two, we can combine those scales with our rhythm from the Paganini, which gives us another ultra efficient and effective practice exercise that sounds like this. Remember, if you're doing that practice exercise, to remember the flick. So whether you're a German bow player doing your sideways yo-yo, or if you're a French bow player doing your T-towel flick, then make sure we're thinking of that and getting that rhythm and that bow stroke really, really accurate. Now, if we take a look at variation one, we have this rhythm, these two semiquavers and a quaver, or uh, two sixteenths and an eighth, that comes again and again with an accent, always on a downbow, nice and dramatic. And, you know, we talked about Paganini being a very dramatic person, and we want to be nice and dramatic when we play this. Now, in the first tutorial video, I said that it would be a good idea, instead of using our open A string here, to actually use the stopped A on the E string. And don't worry, there's a really easy way to find that A. So if you imagine you're in first position on your E string, and you go up open E, one on F sharp, four on G sharp. If we just move our hand a half step, shift down, 
so that our second finger is now in line with our G sharp, then our fourth finger will be there or thereabouts on an A. And you can check that against your open A string, and that's a really good way to check your in tune, using the open string to check that the um, stop note is also in tune. Um, if you're still finding it quite tough to locate, don't worry, just ask your teacher and I'm sure they will help you in your search for the stopped A. Once we've got that note nice and secure and we're happy that we're in the right place, we can see at variation one that we go back and forward between the A and the G sharp. And I've got a little exercise that I want us to try um, to kind of help us with that movement. Now, if you know me well, and I feel that we are starting to know each other very well across this virtual setting, then you know that I like to take things slowly. So the next exercise is a slow, calm and focused exercise that will help our hands and our brains to learn the notes that we need to use at variation one. So we've found our A on the E string by playing open E, first finger on F sharp, G sharp with four fingers, and then if we move our second finger to where our G sharp was, the A should now be there or thereabouts underneath our fourth finger. And I'm really using that open A to tune it in. And the exercise that we're gonna do is gonna practice going back and forward between the A and the G sharp, just like we need to do at variation one. So if you get your metronome ready at 85, and we're gonna try it. So we've got the metronome going at 85, we found our A with our fourth finger and we're now going to go back and forward between A and G sharp four times in one big long slurred bow and keep that going like this. One, two, ready. This exercise is really good for our left hand but it can be quite tough and tiring so make sure if you're getting any pain or you're feeling um, any kind of strain on the muscles in your hand, then take a little break and give your hand a little shake out and come back to it later. Once you feel that you're starting to get comfortable at that tempo of around about 85, similarly to what we did um, in tutorial video number two with increasing the metronome, you can increase it a couple of clicks at a time, just going up and increasing the speed um, of the notes changing. And that will allow you to get a better handle on that movement with your left hand and allows your hands and your brain to really get to know that movement as well, which is super important. Another challenge for us in variation one comes at bar 32, where we have a rest and then we have to explode downwards in a scale onto an explosive accented up bow and then back into our A and G sharp figure. So let's have a little talk about how we can make that work. So bar 32, we have a lot going on. We have an explosive scale going down we then have to do an explosive up bow for an accent on the A, and then we have to find our stopped A and G sharp and play that with a down bow and an accent again already. So there's a lot to really think about. Um, so let's break it down and deal with it in a few bits. So the first one we're gonna look at is this scale that goes down. This is at the end of bar 32, just four notes, E, D, C, and B. So first things first, get our left hand in order, separate bow practice, making sure that we're really happy um, with those notes first of all, and then we can add the slur. Try that a couple of times to make sure you're really getting a smooth connection for the string crossing. The real trick to having smooth, um, to having slurs that go smoothly across strings is to keep the bow moving. So don't, when you think you need to change to another string, don't stop the bow in the change, just keep it moving, keep it flowing. And for this whole bit, I should have said, sorry, excuse me, um, from bar 32, we want to be doing everything in the lower half of the bow. So once you're feeling comfortable with that in a slower speed, you can try adding a little bit of speed if you want, but it's really, really important that we get the accent at the start and that it's nice and smooth. Now, this up bow A it has an accent on it and it is possible. I know that it's obviously much easier to do accents with our down bows, but we can do it on our up bows as well. And to practice that, coming from the string, get a good grip, and just try exploding up the way, like that. Put all that away and really push that sound out, like that. And we can then combine the first, uh, the first part of the scale and the second part of that explosive up bow. And it should sound a little bit like this. Like that. So accent at the start on the E and accent on the A, on the open A string. Like that. Sorry, my ring. Um, 
buzzing off my string there, hopefully you won't have that. And then the hardest bit about this is in 33, the second half of 33, we need to go back to that A and G sharp figure. But don't worry because you have that open A, it gives you time to get your left hand into position. So a super slow-mo version would look like this. We play the scale down. As we explode upwards on the open A, we can move our left hand into position to play the like that. A little bit quicker would be. So using that time, when we are playing the open A explosive up bow accent to move our left hand into position to get ready for the A to the G sharp figure. If we skip ahead to variation number five now, and this is where the big mystery is revealed. At the start, we were doing that exercise where we marched slowly in two, and doing our po, te, to, po, te, to. Now if you look through variation five, there's a couple of bars with kind of scary looking rhythm, you know, there's kind of a quaver, an eighth note, and then a sixteenth note, a semi-quaver kind of hanging around. And what, what, we're, what we have to realise is that actually our potato rhythm comes to our rescue here. So yeah, potatoes can be superheroes too. Can't believe it I said that on camera. Anyway, um, and what I mean by that is if we take bar 98 as an example, or in bar 100 as an example, that rhythm there is just our potato rhythm that we've been learning. So if we think about, uh, if I count from bar 97, it would be one, two, po, te, do. Easy, right? We just use our potatoes to help us get there. But there's a couple of bars where we have kind of, maybe people were a bit hungry and they couldn't finish the whole potato. Um, so bars such as 96, where we just have a tato and no po. In fact, the po has been taken and put at the start of the next bar. So bar 96 would go like this. It would go one, te, to, po, like that. And if you have a look at bar 105, um, someone couldn't finish their potato and it just starts with po, te, and there's no toe at the end of it, okay? Now, you can see how that rhythmic exercise and understanding that rhythm with something silly and simple like potato is actually really helpful. And if we get our instruments now and we can try this rhythm out and talk about where some of those notes live on our basses. So we've talked about the rhythm at Variation 5, but let's go through some of the notes, making sure we know exactly where they all are. And I've got a few tips and a few shortcuts how to make life easier for us when we're playing this music. The start of Variation 5 is pretty straightforward with the A, the B and the A. I'm just going to play for you those first five bars so you can get hear what it sounds like. So one and two and one. So as you remember we were doing in the rhythm exercise, there's no po at that potato, there's just the te to po um, with the po coming at the end, which is very confusing. So that, let's take that bar as a great place to start and looking at bar 96. In this bar we want to be using fourth position. So a great way to find fourth position is to find our high D and put a first finger on our high D and we can check that with our open D string. Once we're happy that we're there, we want to put a fourth finger, because the first note we play is this high E. We want to put four fingers on that E. And then if we go across two strings, and this is a good wee tip, I'm sure lots of you know this, but if you're playing a fourth finger up here in your top string, if you go over two strings down onto the A string and put a first finger, you will have an octave. So the, low, the E that is the octave below that E. So we have the same note, an octave apart, four to one across three strings. So one, two, three. So that can be a really, really um, easy way for us to play both of those notes in bar 96, just staying in the one position. So I'll play from bar 96. It would be one. And then we obviously have to jump and travel back up um, for the next bit in bar 98 and so on. The same thing happens in bar 100. And we can actually stay up in fourth position as well. So if I play from bar uh, 100, it would be one and two and. So as you saw there, I did a, quite a few shifts back, but I'm really using that left hand shape of the octave across three strings, a four finger on the higher string, 
and then uh, first finger on the lower strings and that could be a really good way and if I just break that down even more so I'm talking about in um, bar 100 the E's and then in bar 103 the G's and then in bar 105 the F's and that can be a really nice little shape for us to practice and um, to get our hand uh, into the right place at the right time and play those notes easily. If I just break that down a little bit more, if you look at bar 100, we can use that octave shape, so one to four across three strings. And then we can use the same in bar, what is that, 103, we have the Gs. And then in 105, the F naturals. And that octave shape can be a, like a really, really good thing to practice and a really good thing to get used to because it gives us a good shortcut on how to play an octave in the, the, no matter what area of the fingerboard we are in. Another bit where we need to use fourth position and be really comfortable with using fourth position comes at a bar 114 when we go from being pizzicato to arco. This is um, at the end of a line we have um, a rest and then we come in mezzo piano legato with our bows and actually every single one of the notes that we play in this little phrase can be played in fourth position just like this. <laughs> I played it quite fast there, it will go much slower when we're playing it. Um, but I'll just talk you through that um, really slowly. So we have the E with the fourth finger. So one on the, uh, on the D string for the A. Then four for the B. Then back onto the G string, one four for the D and the E. And here's our little octave trick jump again, over onto the A string for the low E. And back onto the D string for the A. Let's try that once slowly together, so ready. Fantastic guys, make sure you spend a bit of time getting really comfortable in fourth position as it will really help us out with variation five. Well guys, you've worked so hard and I hope uh, you've enjoyed all the exercises we did in this video. Again, you can go back and watch tutorial number one, tutorial number two, and obviously you can re-watch this tutorial. And um, if anything wasn't clear, you know, go back, pause the video and really sort of work on that particular exercise. If you're still finding challenges that are difficult to overcome, don't worry, that is all part of being a musician. And make sure you're asking your instrumental teacher for help, which I'm sure they will be keen to give you and to solve any problems that you're meeting. As always, we love to see uh, videos and pictures or clips of you practicing. So please send them in to us. You can use the hashtag Benedetti Sessions. You can at the Benedetti Foundation on Twitter, on Instagram, we're everywhere. Um, and we love little pictures, little videos of you practicing that really makes us happy and really excited. I'll be seeing you in another video this week. And then we have our second Zoom based sectional on Friday, which I'm super excited about. Um, until then, I just want to leave you with a little message to think about, um, and it kind of follows on from what we were talking about Paganini and you know virtues of violin solos and things. Um, and it's a message that the double bass is often sort of not seen as the most musical of instruments. You know, a lot of people think that we are just kind of big wardrobes with strings on us, and we kind of go plinky plonk um, in the background. And now it is absolutely true that we have a vital job in playing accompaniments and putting bass lines and supporting the harmony and rhythm and that is a completely vital and important job but I want you to always always remember that you are musicians and that it's really important that we are always trying to say something musical when we're playing our instrument. It doesn't matter if it's just an entire part of pizzicato, we're still thinking about the shape, we're still thinking about the phrase, thinking about the dynamics and when we're working on our solo pieces you know, some people, when they hear solo double bass, they kind of go, solo double bass, well, how does that work? Well, I'll tell you right now that I've heard some of the most beautiful music played on the double bass. And there's a real responsibility and privilege that we have to make sure that we are always striving to be as musical as we can on our instruments and to let that story come out, to let the character to come out, to, to, to say what we're trying to say with our music. And because... People see us as wardrobes with strings on going plinky plunk. It's doubly important that we emphasise and stress that musicality and let it come out. So when you're practising uh, this week and forevermore, always thinking about what you're trying to say and thinking about the best way.
to let the music come out. Until next time, bye bye.